Um, I had actually two questions. Mm-hmm. Um, one is just a question, and then the other is kind of a scenario with a question. Um, first, what is the difference between polygamy and polyamory? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, yes. that's that's a good one. Um, and very important distinction. <laughs> let's just break it down with the words themselves. Poly, multiple, amory relates to love, so multiple loves, whereas polygamy would break down just etymologically speaking, mm-hmm. as many wives. Mm-hmm. So polygamy is what you get with, um, the, the, for example, the Mormons who have the multiple wives. The way that it tends to get practiced in that community tends to be with very young women and much very older Very misogynist, men. Yeah. very... Mm. Yeah, so polyamory is, I mean, I am by no means a polygamist wife. <laughs> <laughs> at all. <laughs> so really we're, okay. we're talking about, they often get conflated, but we're talking about like the institution of marriage versus the, the, the fact, the intangible essence of love. And that's really where it comes into. And the term polyamory, uh, I mean, poly folks love to point out that it's a awkward blending of Latin and Greek roots. Yes. It's by far not it a be perfect word. Should be multi or yeah, uh, it's poly arrows. What are what are <laughs> any words other than just things that people made up to try and express an idea? And that particular term has a few different folks arguing over their uh, creation of it. Um, but it, it largely came from an attempt to differentiate from these other things as an attempt to get away from the idea of group marriage mm. and, and these different things, which, you know, are generally speaking very misogynist in nature. Uh, certainly there are examples as we look through history, as we look through an- the anthropology of all these different cultures, there are plenty of examples of group marriage uh, with one woman and multiple men and, and these different things. But in reality, it's rarely practiced that way. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, Dr. David Lay, uh, a speaker I've talked about here a couple of times, uh, does a really beautiful job of pointing out that in many ways, the polyamory movement couldn't happen until the feminist movement was already starting to gain some ground. Mm-hmm. And that polyamory is in a lot of ways a way of making this idea that men have had forever polygamy, this idea of, of sleeping with multiple people, of cheating, of, you know, these different things. Uh, and making it palatable to women. Or equal. Yeah, but I mean, just by making it an <laughs> even playing field for really the first time. I mean, I, I, when we talk about polyamory, I think it's important to recognize that humans are largely unchanged for the entirety of human recorded history. But uh, our society, our cultures have evolved and changed. And even though we don't want to act as if polyamory just got invented last week, there have been shades of it uh, for, you know, going Millennia. back as far as we can read. Uh, but it is sort of a new idea in a lot <laughs> of ways in the values that it puts forward and the things that it uh, makes important. And egalitarianism is a big part of that. So I, I hope that answers the question a little bit. <laughs> it does. It does. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, well, okay, so my follow-up question really was, so... I'm a brand new atheist, and I got married Congratulations. about two years ago. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Um, but we got married while I was still, I still considered myself a Christian. Mm-hmm. And fortunately for me, I've discussed my uh, sexual preferences with my husband before we got married. So he knew that I've had fun times with girls, you know, and things like that. And he's fine with it. Um, but moving forward, I've discovered that I have a bi curiosity that I'd like to explore. Mm -hmm. Um, I've also learned about myself that I've never had a, um, romantic relationship with a woman while I have had sexual relationships with women. Mm -hmm. Um, but moving forward, my, husband and I talked to his mother, his mother about this as well. Um, she's concerned that if we do somehow migrate towards like an open relationship, that our relationship will be at stake. And I'm wondering if there are like statistics, like 
versus you know open marriages versus closed and i'm wondering how that can possibly yeah so have you ever have you ever heard of a monogamous marriage that um ended badly yes there you go <laughs> <laughs> They, I mean, there is definitely a piece of that. There's this, uh, you know, when, you know, the, sorry, the best example I can think of is this great XKCD comic uh, where two mathematicians are staring at each other and one male mathematician says to the other mathematician, you suck at math. And then in the next frame, it's the exact same equation written incorrectly on the board and the male mathematician says to the now female mathematician, girls suck at math. Mm. And there's mm-hmm. this constant idea when a poly relationship blows up, becomes problematic, is in some way healthy or unhealthy, uh, that it's the polyamory that was at fault. Uh, and, you know, I would definitely push back against that. But maybe to, to better answer your question, are there statistics? Are there, is there good data about what it would look like, what the outcomes are? I can tell you that they don't exist. Uh, I've looked for them, right. and they're they're really not out there. There are there is some interesting research coming out. Uh, I love on to talk on this show about uh, Dr. Elizabeth Sheff, who in particular is sort of on the forefront of a lot of that research. The Polyamorous Next Door is a great book to read to understand a little bit about what this world looks like uh, for folks who are not just trying to figure out how to open up a relationship, but people who are well down the road who have been doing it their entire lives and how that functions for them. And there's an attempt there to do as much actual data collecting and to put together statistics and these different things. And preliminarily, it seems like they more or less line up with every other form of relationship. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, the, mm. the thing is that happy, healthy poly relationships just, they don't get talked about much. Uh, I mean, mm. they exist, but these are just people living their lives. So it's not right. remarkable. Uh, it's, you know, like, for example, the V I was describing earlier uh, where she's married to both of them. I mean, they're just tooling along, having their jobs. There's no life, uh, the Lifetime kids. original movie no. about that relationship. So, but it is. <laughs> oh, but I if happen, there could be. <laughs> exactly. I happen to know them, so I happen to know that they're all very happy and mm-hmm. everything's going really well for them. Um, but when it blows up, uh, that you tend to hear about. Yeah. Especially because folks uh, who... Uh, the, the whole monogamy thing, they'll tend to point to it to say, see, I told you it would never work. Mm -hmm. So when something blows up, it Mm -hmm. gets, it becomes the poster child for why it doesn't work. Whereas you don't hear about the ones that do work. And again, I'll go back to um, monogamy doesn't protect you from dysfunction in a relationship Mm -hmm. because if it did, the divorce rate wouldn't be what it is. I was going to say, yeah, um, actually, hearing it's just as surprising to hear people talk about a happily functional monogamous relationship Mm -hmm. so it's not like it's restricted just to polyamory you know doesn't work out no like you said the divorce rate i mean there's something there right relationships fail Yeah. yeah and and even as we're starting to get the initial statistics people are actually starting to look into these things and investigate these questions uh what we get back is sort of confusing and it's difficult to separate out a a better model is to look at the outcomes for gay marriage as it's become increasingly available Mm -hmm. and it's now legal all over the united states it's very difficult to say how do these statistics look compared to the regular population to the folks who have had access to marriage forever and how will they look 20 years from now because as people are sort of shifting and adjusting there were a lot of people that because they finally could get married rushed out and felt like it was their civic duty to (laughs) do so whether it was a good fit for them or not at the same time there are different types of pressures that still exist for people in homosexual marriages there are this uh, this burden to be perfect, to be right all the time. So it's it's tricky, it's complicated, and even the numbers that we have, uh, which are very few, are difficult to interpret. So it's going to be, in my mind, a minimum of 20 years before we're going to have any kind of real data to look at what is likely to happen to a polyamorous relationship. And even that misses the ultimate question of 
what is your relationship going to be like? Mm -hmm. What kind of relationship do you want to have? And for what? that, that's a question that only you can really answer. Because what works for you might not necessarily work for someone else. Okay. Well, how, how can I go about meeting people other than Tinder? Oh, yeah. Um, Lily, I think this one is squarely <laughs> right in your up your court. alley. Yeah. It so is. Uh, depends where you are, for one thing, uh, because uh, different communities have got different levels of uh, active poly folks in community. Mm -hmm. um, so Tinder has not been super fruitful uh, for most of the people. I was actually just having I've this had some conversation. Good, look at it. Good. good luck with it, yeah. <laughs> I was just having this conversation on Facebook. Uh -huh. Literally just um, it, somebody was saying... Dating apps for poly folks are, are, it's weak. It is. They exist, they're mostly garbage. I, yep. I actually just tried. I tried to download a couple of dating apps and tried to kind of find you know, a, a buddy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and nobody's interested in me because I mentioned that I'm married, and I think that they think that it's going to have to be like this, he's going to be involved or mm -hmm. he's not. I, I don't know. I think I'm confusing people huh. about what I want. Uh, yeah, you might you might look at how you're writing the profile. Tinder is difficult simply because there's very little space to write. Mm -hmm. whereas and people aren't sorting out looking for people right. like you. Whereas OkCupid, okay oh, okay. for example, you can write a novel for your profile. And you can explicitly say that I am non-monogamous. I'm only looking for relationships that are non-monogamous. And then people can find you in that way. Right. And you can also sort for it um, to, to be very clear in there to say, I want to find the second, the other love of my life, or I want a fuck buddy. You can be really clear. <laughs> Viable oh, options. Yeah. <laughs> These are, and they're all options. So because OkCupid okay allows you to write novels there, you can get really clear. Now, does that mean they're going to actually read your profile? No. <laughs> no, they are not. Um, so um, none of these sites are perfect. There's a new one that has just started that is designed to be very flexible and to include the concept of polyamory. It's called Hashtag Open. Hmm. I have not downloaded it yeah, yet. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't, I tried, haven't that tried that myself. I haven't tried it yet. Uh, Dan Savage keeps recommending it. <laughs> which, okay, okay. Okay. I don't know, um, but I mean, there's a there's a gap in the in, you know there's a niche that needs yeah. to be filled for mm -hmm. this. Um, but outside of being online, uh, depending on where you are, uh, for example, we're in Austin, where it's a big uh, there's a huge poly community here, and uh, our local Facebook community has um, really been a, a very happy hunting grounds for a lot of us. I can't find any of them. Oh. It, a lot they're, of they're, these they're are secret. closed and secret groups. Yeah. Uh, oftentimes finding one person to let you into one can yes. be the gateway into exactly. meeting everybody that's in. Because there's so much overlap. It seems like every group I'm in at least 50% of those people are in this the group other and that group. And the way it works in Austin is there is one group that is, uh, I don't think it's a secret group, but it's a closed group. And um, it's got a fairly generic name, uh, uh, Austin Polyamory or something like that. It's very generic. When you find that one, it is the landing pad that allows you to Open make the, the acquaintances who will then invite you into mm -hmm. the closed and secret groups. Mm. And then the closed and secret groups, well, oh my goodness, we have plenty of them. <laughs> um, there's mm. there's one that is for nothing but uh, these poly cocktails, which by the way, you might try looking up. That's a national organization. Because yeah. it is a national organization. Those groups okay. are all over the place and they meet once a month literally for cocktails and chatting. Uh, it's not supposed to be a cruising space or a dating space. It's But a, naturally. But it is. I mean, simply, it's not, but it is. Simply because, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's interesting people and you're you're getting to know them. Um, and then there's, uh, there's groups that are just for poly women. Uh, I run a group that is the ATX Poly Dating, and that is supposed to be a dating group. Um, I also run K&P, which is Kinky and Polly Austin. Um, there's a 
there's a group that is for nothing but sharing nudes. <laughs> there's a, so whatever you're oh, into, whatever you're yeah. into. you want to negotiate. One of wow. one of my boyfriends is a brewer. He runs a poly fermentation club. Oh, I've seen that. I've yeah, been, I need an invite to that. <clears throat> Absolutely, uh, I can hook you up with that. <laughs> um, yeah, there's hundreds of them. They're all over the place, but you have to you have to kind of find the the door in your local area, and then. That's going to be a great way to actually mm-hmm. meet people. So, so we, we is, hear so you it that a good it's. Idea? Oh well, yeah, I'm I'm sorry. Just to f- interrupt. Um, we hear you that it can I feel see. like when you just type into Google that like you're getting nothing back, and that can be true to an extent. But I mean, once you get past the shimmery camouflage <laughs> uh, shield bubble, there's this beautiful, thriving Wakandan nation of poly people. Yes. Uh, desperate to have you in it. So and we're, and we're keep hiding. looking. <laughs> Once you get like through that, you know, special magic yes. hole, we're here for you. And we're hiding because okay. some of our bosses wouldn't understand. Yeah. Mm. And some of the, oh, I'm sure. the some of exes the parents, of yeah. the parents and yeah, mm-hmm. all of that. Uh, mm-hmm. So there's a good reason for, for the subterfuge there, but right. find us. And uh, so if you do happen to be in Austin, I'd say hit us up after the show <laughs> and uh, you can talk to Lily. Yeah, I'll look you up. <laughs> okay, awesome. Uh, th- thank y'all so much. Uh, thank you. 